Lord in prayer, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, you are the source of all goodness, generosity, and love. We thank you for opening the hearts of many to those who are fleeing for their lives. Help us now to open our arms in welcome and reach out our hands in support that the desperate may find help and lives torn apart may be restored. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who fled persecution at his birth and at his last triumph over death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, okay, as I said, we do have several presenters and the first is Kent Ferris and Kent is the Director of Social Action and Capital Securities for the Diocese. Um, Kent, if you wanna go ahead, I'm gonna put your graphic up. In 1975, the Diocese of Davenport opened doors for our Refugee Resettlement Office. Over the years and with the direction of the late Nora Dvorak, the resettlement program became nationally recognized. During her years, hundreds of refugees from Vietnam and Bosnia were resettled. In 1999, with great sadness, the resettlement office closed and operations were transferred to another community agency. With that transition, Nora spoke words that are as important for us to hear today, 22 years later. Helping refugees find jobs and housing is essential, but if what we want is a community that welcomes people of other languages and cultures, we need to help them by being hospitable. Nora spoke of a community-wide effort, the likes of which we will hear about today. As we hear of present day efforts and needs, May this Lunch and Learn be dedicated to our beloved sister in Christ, Nora Dvorak. Thank you, Kent. Okay, I'd like to introduce our um, first presenter. Javi Timbo is with uh, World Relief Quad Cities. And um, this is an organization that's helping to resettle refugees in our communities. Um, and I believe that Laura Fontaine, who is Director of World Relief, is also here with us today, but Javi's going to be doing the presentation. So Javi, I'll let you take it away. Okay, thank you guys so much. Can you hear me? Awesome. So I'm going <laughs> to, it's so, I'm so thankful to be here with you guys today. I had not really heard much about your organization um, when Laura asked me to kind of come to the meeting, and I'm so thankful because um, it's great to see just a community of people willing to help support refugees and immigrants in our community. So thanks again for having me. Um, so with my presentation, I'm going to start with a little bit of a video clip. I'll give you a little brief inner overview of World Relief. Um, and then I'm going to really open it up for question and answer rather than go through my presentation. But um, if there are too many questions, then I'll, I'll kind of go through it more thoroughly. Um, before I get started, are there any questions, any, anything I need to know? Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. So let me share my screen. Um, so. All right. We're all, all good. You guys can see my screen here. No? Yes? Yeah. I can see it. You can see it? I can see it. Okay, awesome. I don't know if this is showing me the screen that I want to. All right, so um, just kind of to start, we have this uh, quote, uh, you know, give me your tired, your poor, your um, huddled masses yearning for uh, breath free, the, the wretched refuse of our uh, teeming shore, send these, the homeless, the tempest to toast to me and I'll lift my lamp besides the golden door. Um, and so that's just kind of um, a quote and a motto that we really look at World Relief. We are, our goal here is to welcome our new refugees and the immigrants that come to our door um, and our, we really, really hate to turn people away. Um, and so World Relief Quad Cities, we are based in Moline. We serve traditionally most of Rock Island County and some of the surrounding counties on Illinois. But these last years, we've really been working on getting onto the Iowa side, being able to offer services um, to immigrants and refugees in, in both states. Um, my name is Javi Timbo. 
uh, here is my email if you want to reach out to me if you're interested in any volunteer um, opportunities or if you have any additional questions or any information that you think would be beneficial that I know please contact me by email. Um, and then I was just gonna go through our website a little bit just so you guys can get a glance at it. Hey, Hobby, this is Laura. Nothing okay. is changing from the first screen. Okay, thank you for letting me know. <laughs> Let me do a new share. Okay, let's do... Are you seeing it now? The now we're seeing the website, website. yep. Okay, that's what I was getting to. So. Um, here is just our website, uh, World Relief Quad Cities. If you have any questions or anything else you want to know, it has tons of information and you can definitely contact us through our website. And then, here. All right. Are you able to see the PowerPoint again? No? Yes. yes. We're on your second page, Hobby, with the point of contact. Okay. Awesome. Now I'm going to play a video. Do you guys see this one that says Journey to a New Land? No. No. Give me one moment. Let me do some. <clears throat> there we go. You seeing it better? Yes. Okay. Now you have to start it. All right. What? While Hobby um, tries to figure out our video, I'll give you guys some background information on World Relief Quad Cities. Um, we're the only refugee resettlement agency in a 110 mile radius, um, and we offer services from employment to um, immigration legal services, youth mentoring, um, the, the list continues. And I have my little friend, my, my son, the four-year-old here too. So hopefully he can chime in right now. <laughs> um, but in the last two years, we have been able to um, resettle 193 refugees, 206 secondary migrants. So is secondary migrants a familiar term with people? No. So the, the difference, a secondary migrant is a refugee that was resettled in another state before coming to the Quad Cities. So we might have refugees that were resettled um, by Catholic Charities in New York or in Boston, and then their case will be ch changed over to uh, our office. Um, and people are coming because low cost of living, um, there's jobs, they have world relief, they have um, support and churches around their community. Hobby, you want to try again? Yeah. Are you seeing it? Okay. Yes. As our footprints paint a picture of our journey to a new land, please remember why we left, escaping ruin and the horrors of war while saying goodbye to our people and culture. Our journey began when the explosions arrived at our doorstep, when survival consumed our thoughts. For some of us, our journey began when we could no longer hope for our future. And for others, it began because we were once the tired, the poor, the huddled masses yearning to be free. So we left home. We left our community, the laughter of our friends, the songs of our nation, the teaching of our school, the taste of our food. We left everything. Hoping for safety and freedom, we traveled hundreds, thousands of miles, often in bleak conditions, 
just to land on these shores, to set foot on this Our first steps were often met with unwelcoming eyes and cruel words, but we have discovered so much more. We've received warmth, generosity, and grace. You have joined us in caring for our children. Our neighbors have helped us settle into new homes. Our allies have fought alongside us for our rights, our protection, and our voice. This new land has given us her best, and we will give her ours. As much as we have received, we also seek to provide to strengthen this great nation, creating opportunity for every man, woman, and child. So let us write a new chapter of our story together, welcoming as we have been welcomed, defending and empowering people from every birthplace and heritage, and may we stand together to pursue peace, justice, and equality for everyone who calls this great land home. Awesome. What did you guys think? Did anything stick out to you guys? One of the reasons we share that video is I think it really, it, it shows a refugee's journey or an immigrant's journey. They are leaving family behind, their culture, their food, um, and maybe they didn't want to come to the United States. You know, a lot of refugees don't have a choice. Um, so I, I think that video, I don't know, I always cry. It, it's it's such an emotional um, journey, and, and I'm happy that we have a community here that, that wants to walk alongside um, our refugees um, to, to go in that journey. I got a question. On that journey, <clears throat> do they go it alone or does someone go with them to get to their next point? Mm -hmm. So um, it depends on their final destination. Um, so we had an arrival yesterday and they left, um, I believe it was in Zimbabwe or Tanzania and then have a layover, then they go to Chicago and then they come to the Quad Cities if they're gonna be relocated here. So we have a welcome team, um, but usually, you know, it just depends where, what agency they're working with. Um, but all the documents are done through State Department, um, Office of Refugee and Population, um, you know, the complete background check. But yeah, when they're on that plane, their final destination is they'll meet somebody from an agency. Okay, but nobody journeys with them because what happens if they get, like say, what if they get in trouble along the way? Say say they were speeding accidentally and got stopped. Mm -hmm. um, are you talking about when they're overseas? No, or... here, in the, here in the United States. So when they, when they come here, yeah, we, I mean, World Relief um, is with, you know, a lot of our clients, five years, um, even more. Um, and if we don't have the programs, I refer a lot of people over to um, the diocese or to Anne McGlynn's Tapestry Farms. If we don't have um, any programs for them to fill, you know, uh, fit in. Um, but as far as like speeding tickets, yes, we have caseworkers that will go to court with um, a refugee. You know, we will have somebody um, to interpret as well. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I think if I can time in here. Yeah. Uh, this is Ben Zahir from Center for Local Justice. As a migrant who came here, I, it's just uh, our father, Dennis. This is just a learning experience. Of course, you know, as soon as you arrive here, uh, no matter if you are refugees or if you are immigrated by any kind of uh, another visa, at the end, uh, you have to learn the, the rules and the regulation is applied to you. So uh, sometimes you don't know this is uh, something maybe in your country is possible, maybe it's not possible here. And so it is just a learning journey. Uh, you just navigate until you understand. And when you have 
somebody knew you, you tell them about it up front, that will help people. Yeah. I have. I completely agree. I I, yeah, I think. Oh, go yeah, ahead. I'm sorry. sorry. I'm one of the top three employment places that um, people that you have helped in the last year landed. So, so go ahead, yeah, Poppy, so, go ahead. Um, I would say our number one is probably Tyson Foods in Hillsdale, um, X-Pack, which is in Milan. Um, and then lately we've gotten a lot of hype for the younger students, uh, hy has been- So the packing houses are the number one place? Um, so it's, the reason why that they're really amenable is because they are, a really good like entry level place to start for a lot of our clients while they're still working on their English. Well, I'm a former labor educator. Mm -hmm. One of my research interests was packing houses. Have you been in a packing house? Um, I've been to Tyson and mm -hmm. XPAC. Yeah. Um, that would be very problematic in my view, particularly during the COVID pri crisis in Iowa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for both of those locations, they are um, following all state uh, protocol for COVID-19. And I oh, know for excuse me. That's according to Tyson. That is, not yeah. according, that is not according to United Food and Commercial Workers Union, nor has the Iowa governor visited those. And packing houses in Iowa were the number one place in the early stages where people died. So... I don't mean to be abrupt about this, but for 40 years, packing houses have been hell holes in Iowa. Yeah. And um, just to, to make this more immediate, you can recognize a packing house worker after six months because they're scarred. Mm -hmm. They're scarred mm -hmm. in their faces, they're scarred on their arms um, because of the knives, the abundance of knives yeah. in the district. And um, I just, I would just say that Tyson is a dubious partner at best. Yeah. And Claire, Claire, I, I, we echo your same sentiments with Tyson. Um, we have a lot of our clients work on the Jocelyn plant in Illinois. And so part of our advocacy is I've been working with um, Representative um, Sherry Bustos, Representative Mike Halpin, for them to go in to these factories and see what really is going on firsthand. So those representatives in Illinois have been very hands-on um, since the COVID outreach. We've also made sure that our clients, if they were off of work for two weeks, that they are getting you know, their wages that they were promised if they're, they're taking that time. And that also, if they get their test, they're able to go back to work. So um, there are a lot of advocacy avenues um, that we, you know, we work with as well as, you know, different, you know, lawmakers, policymakers. Um, and I would say for us right now, it's more the Illinois side. Um, when, you know, the caseworker, um, you know, recommends going to Tyson. And I want to say Tyson is our, you know, number one employer, but they are there because our clients, um, they, if they don't know English, this is another way. It's more of a survival job. Um, until they can learn English fluently and do what they did back in their home country here. I understand, Laura. You're talking to somebody who was researching and in packing houses for 25 years. They are hell holes at best. Perry, uh, and they have always used immigrants, right? When they are, if, I, if I can for a moment. If, <clears throat> I, I think I've said my piece. Okay, because I was going to say, I, I appreciate your point of view very much. And I'm sure, um, as does everybody else, but I think since we're um, here to focus on the resettlement aspect, that's probably what we need to move on to. Mm -hmm. oh. and, and I am glad to hear that um, World Relief is, is involved in advocacy as well as the nuts and bolts of the resettlement, so. Awesome. Um, so you guys, you guys can see my screen now correctly? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you for, uh, thanks so much for your guys, your input. Okay, so World Relief was founded in 1944. Um, we are not just in the United States, we are all over the world, um, which is something we really love um, because we have that international input in all of the work that we do. Um, and then in World Relief Pod Cities, we specifically work on refugee resettlement. We have the Immigrant Family Resource Program. We help with unemployment. 
We offer citizenship services, and then we offer a food pantry. And uh, also ESL as well. Hey, Javi, can you talk about the food pantry and why it's yeah. so unique to our, sure. to our Quad City community? Oh, for sure. So we um, currently, I'll come back to this one. We do the International Food Pantry um, here at World Relief. Uh, I am the coordinator of it currently. And so what we do every month is we have a food distribution. We have volunteers that help us set up and distribute the food. And we usually have food in our food baskets that clients cannot get at a traditional food pantry. So we specifically contract some of our food out from a local Burmese store. It's actually the owner's a refugee. So it's awesome because she really helps us understand the community and she helps us with outreach. Um, but she gives us food like um, stewed chickens that are uh, kind of, you know, not kind of different than what you would find at Hy-Vee. Um, we have bamboo. We have tons of jasmine rice because that's the, the type of rice that our clients really like. Um, we have fufu, which is an African, almost like potato uh, uh, stew. So we offer some of the things that our clients won't be able to uh, have at a different food pantry. And then that also gives us an opportunity to link them to other services and kind of check in with them. Um, so we, this has been a great project. We've had a lot of community organizations and churches that have sponsored it each month. We've also had a lot of different churches and organizations send volunteers that help us with the distribution. And um, due to the COVID pandemic, we actually started doing some deliveries of food pantries for families that couldn't originally come to ours. Um, so that's been um, a change and we've had a giant amount of increase. I think we have tripled the number of families that we serve um, every every month. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so sorry, sorry to interrupt. I wanted to bring in um, another one of the presenters to kind of offer um, some information about what they're doing. Okay, perfect. Um, Anne McGlynn is the founder and executive director of Tapestry Farms. And um, I know that they've been uh, integral in promoting equity in a lot of different areas, um, food access, housing. And so Anne, I just wondered if you would tell us a little bit about um, Tapestry Farms and, the, and how you all are walking with the refugees um, in our community. Well, thanks for having us. And uh, Javi, by the way, I feel like I talk to about a million times a week. Yeah, um, we do. <laughs> <laughs> she, Javi is really good at what she does and um, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without um, Hobby and the others at World Relief. So um, Tapestry Farms is a nonprofit urban farm system that invests in refugees. Now that sounds really fancy, um, but we're only about three and a half years old. Um, so we're not very big yet. Um, we work with about 10 families at a time. Um, we work longer term with families that face more significant barriers um, uh, to a thriving life. So single parents, um, families with significant medical issues, um, families who did not have access to education in either their country of origin or in their refugee camp. Um, and we just work to build systems around each of the families um, as best we can. Um, uh, the clients that we uh, work with are eligible for everything that American citizens are eligible for. So they are eligible for food stamps, they're eligible for Medicaid. Um, that's where hobby comes in a lot is ensuring access to those benefits, um, which are key um, to ensuring that, that families can, um, can establish their lives here. We are uh, recognizing that refugees often come with um, some really incredible um, skills in the area of growing food. We are building an urban farm system in areas in our community um, that face uh, food apartheid. Um, they're also known as food deserts, areas where um, there's a lack of um, 
access to fresh food at affordable prices. I'm going to share my screen just for a millisecond. I want to I want to show you a picture of Charlene. Um, Charlene is actually um, pretty much the reason why Tapestry Farms exists. We um, the church I used to work with, St. Paul Lutheran in Davenport, welcomed Charlene and her family through World Relief um, about three and a half years ago. Nope, four years ago. Wow, four years ago. Time flies. Um, and she brought me a bowl of spinach in June of 2017. And that's what, um, that is why Tapestry Farms exists. So I'm going to show you a picture of Charlene, just because I adore her. Um, Charlene and her husband just had a baby and his name is Hussein and he is about the cutest um, baby ever. So we work um, in the areas of housing, education, work, um, uh, medical and mental health care um, because of the extreme amounts of trauma that lots of refugees have endured. Um, we work hard, not always successfully, at connecting um, people with mental health resources to work through that trauma. Um, we work through citizenship um, processes with them. Uh, refugees are uh, required to apply for their green cards um, after they've been in country for a year. And so there again, we work with World Relief. Um, there's a a uh, very skilled gentleman by the name of Rotko who um, has the ability to um, fill out green card applications. Um, that is an expensive and um, more so a extraordinarily cumbersome process at times involving um, trips to places like Chicago and Des Moines and Rockford um, that are not always so easy to navigate. And so um, we help make that happen. And then also community. So if a kid wants to play soccer, we try to get them on a soccer team. If a kid wants to play the clarinet, we try to find them a clarinet and hook them up with band lessons. Um, so I'm trying to think if there's anything else important. Um, the urban farm system, um, we were just, uh, leased an empty plot of land at 3rd and Brown Streets in Davenport. If you're familiar with King's Harvest or the German American Heritage Center, it's down in that neck of the woods. And so um, while we did garden last year and were able to successfully grow a lot of food that we gave away predominantly to refugee families in our community, um, this year we're going to be building a plot from the ground up in hopes that it will serve as a model for our next plots, which we hope will be in Rock Island. We see over and over again, when families are fed well, then they can tackle the world. Thanks, Anne. You're welcome. Um, I, I love the gardens. Um, I have a daughter who's doing a degree in public health and is very focused on um, food equity, so. Um, oh, I have a question, if we're taking any. Um, I'm going to let our next presenter speak and then we will, Lindsay, real quick. Okay. Okay. I, I'm starting to see that there's this great interconnectedness between all of the groups who are um, supporting the refugees who are moving to our community. Because the next person who's going to speak is coming from the individual perspective, and that's Nikki Gant. Nikki is um, a volunteer or a, a parishioner at St. Paul the Apostle in Davenport, but she told me that she has a heart for the outsiders. And I think she's definitely putting that heart uh, together with her hands and her feet to do the work. So I want to share a little bit about your, um, your participation in walking with Rick. Um, well, first I would just like to say hello to Abby because we've been messaging about um, a refugee family, but we haven't seen each other. So it's nice to see your face, but, um, and thank World Relief because I wouldn't have had an opportunity to, um, serve refugees without them having that infrastructure in place, uh, you know, over there in Moline. But a couple of years ago, I think four or five years ago, I saw on World Relief's website that there was a single mom of five who was going to be relocating here as a refugee from the Congo. 
and you know, you just get that Holy spirit. Like I'm meant to do this now. And so I just, you know, messaged them and I got in touch with them. And before I knew it, a group of my girlfriends and I had gone through the training for what they called the, um, I think they called it the good neighbors program. So went and got background checks and then we were picking this family up at the airport um, and you know here this mom arrives looking completely exhausted with like a beach bag and five kids and no idea how to speak English so we were really blessed to walk with them through that first six months which was what we signed up for but then you know you start to get kind of attached to the family a year or two years and you know we're still in touch with that family but some of the things that we were doing with them were as simple as like teaching them to use a can opener. I mean, never. They'd lived all these years in a refugee camp and they just didn't have the same appliances as us to um, teach them to use the busing system and um, taking them to their medical appointments and, you know, building relationships with the kids, you know, taking them to do fun things. Um, well, what else did we do? It just seems like there was an endless list of tasks, like helping them to, you know, look for work when that time came and get to their English as a second language classes. And um, it was just a really meaningful experience. Oh, like the girlfriends who we all did that together, we all kind of came away feeling more like really inspired. Like you, it's almost like, okay, well, now I know that if worst case scenario happens in my life and I somehow become a refugee, well, I'll just be like the bin was because they were incredibly, um, inspiring people. They were full of joy and life. And, and so um, really it was just, you know, a gift to be able to do that. And I can say I just received an email, a text from their oldest son, Fabrice. He was very, probably the most personable of the kids and really took that big brother, you know, leadership role seriously. But he just recently asked if I, if he could come to our church. So he's this Sunday for the first time to St. Paul's, you know, he had come a couple of times, like back now he speaks English and, you know, to continue that relationship with him. And he has, um, his mother does work in the factories. I know that discussion came up and one of the things that motivates him is he wants her to not have to work in the factories. So he is a high school graduate. He graduated from Rocky and he took on an electrician apprenticeship. So he's already working as an electrician, but then now I couldn't believe this about six months ago, he told me that he had started a network marketing business. So here he's trying, he's got two jobs now and he's, um, he just went to Texas. Like he's got, he just went to Texas to get some extra training, but he wound up um, finding mentorship through another refugee from Africa, you know, who was in this. So, um, so it's just nice to see that with some support, how, constructive and one of his things that he wants to do is help refugees here in the community as he establishes himself and kind of lifts his family up out you know so um so that was gratifying and then more recently through world relief group of us from st paul's are you know working through the cultural partnership team program that world relief offers now to provide very similar for family from um the a burmese family of refugees. And when you guys were talking about the food um, pantry offering those ethnic cuisine, I was thinking, well, it's a good thing you do because the bin was let us try fufu and it's really good. And then we don't know our new family as well yet. So they haven't offered us any food, but their house always smells really, really good. I think it's it's that um, that rice that you were, you were mentioning. So I just wanted to share my personal experience. I mean, I'm a busy mom. I've got four kids and a lot going on. But we were able to make time for this. And um, the other thing, anyone else who's thinking about, you know, reaching out to Ann or Habby about a volunteer opportunity, um, people get interested in this. Like I maybe put up a couple Facebook posts when we did this with the bin was five years ago. And I, I, I can't stand social media, but um, next time when we started asking around, people remembered that and it had sparked their interest. And then we actually had quite a few people when we put it in the bulletin at St. Paul's who wanted to get involved in this new group. So I think it's something people are interested in. They just need like that bridge built within the parish to just know there's opportunities. And then someone just kind of spearheaded or break, it's, it's kind of uncomfortable. I mean, it's kind of hard because you're just like, don't speak the same language and it's awkward, but, but it's much more gratifying if you can push through that. And I think um, just a good opportunity that both of those organizations offer, so.
Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Nikki. Um, before we open it up for questions, uh, we have one more person who's going to talk with us a little bit, and that is Griselda Garnica, and she is in the immigration office at the diocese. And um, he is going to tell us a little bit about the services that they would offer to refugees who have moved to our community, because not everybody is aware that we have an immigration office with immigration counselors in the diocese. So, Griselda? Yes. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, my name is Griselda Garnica, and I have, I have been working for the Diocese and Immigration Program for 22 years. I've been accredited by the Department of Justice for 17 years. Our office uh, consists of two accredited counselors, one part-time um, administrative assistant and one volunteer. Due to COVID, right now, we are handling our cases um, remotely via phone, email, and mail. It has been working very well for our clients so far. Our office is and has been handling um, refugees uh, with their next step once they're ready for the next step, which is adjustment of status. Uh, once they're ready, once they accumulate one year, then they will be ready to adjust their status and we help with that process. Also, some um, are interested on applying for their citizenship as soon as they can. We also help them with the citizenship process. Uh, we offer other services, uh, DACA, work permits, um, petitions for relatives. If you want the complete list, you can visit our website for the complete list and it'll list every, every service that we offer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Griselda. So um, I, I want to open it up for questions and comments, if that's okay with all of our presenters. And then if, if we have time, I do, I would like to know from each of you eventually, like, it, are you looking for more volunteers? Do you need more assistance from the community? But let's, if it's okay, let's take a few questions at first. Um, anybody have a question? Uh, yeah. Um, um, uh, my name is Lindsay Steele. I work for the Catholic Messenger, which is the diocesan newspaper, and I'm writing um, an article about this lunch and learn. Um, so I just wanted to clarify a couple things or boring questions. Um, Laura, you had mentioned how many people um, your organization had helped the last two years. It was, I think you said 193 refugees, but I didn't catch um, how many secondary migrants. I think it was over 200, but I didn't yeah, catch we that. Yeah, 206 secondary migrants. Okay. Um, so 193 okay. refugees from overseas. And this is until fiscal year yeah. or from our last fiscal year. That's okay, not a problem. And then the second one was just, uh, since this is my first time hearing about these organizations and I'm glad to know that they exist. Um, but uh, your organization and Anne's organization, are they both different organizations doing the same thing or are they connected somehow? I, so they're different organizations, um, but I would say we do a lot of the same work and Anne traditionally has a lot more uh, work on the Iowa side. Okay. And I okay. would say we complement each other. Um, if we don't have additional resources, you know, or Anne needs additional resources, mm -hmm. we work together to support our families and um, yeah, community. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so to just give an ex just to give an example, um, we don't uh, we don't have someone who has the certification through DOJ to fill out um, to do uh, adjustments of status. Um, so that's a that's a gap that we have. We hope to fill that gap at some point in time. But that's a gap that we have, and so we rely on. Um, Rocco at World Relief, and I'm so happy to hear the diocese has that. So I might be in touch with them. Um, whereas, um, you know, World Relief or another one of the agencies might not have uh, the the funding source to um, help a family stay in their home who's been in the country for eight years. Um, so that that is that's an instance where we where we can step in. We do have the funding to do that. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Um, we did have a, 
uh, one asked a question through chat and he was wondering if you um, are settling a, in a particular ethnic group or country of origin or, I mean, and that's something I'm curious about too, because my understanding is they really make an effort to settle refugees where they are going to be with um, people of the, from the same country of origin, because that just helps them feel more at home more quickly. So. Yeah, so traditionally our refugees are resettled from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, sometimes the surrounding countries, they, the children might be from Burundi or places like that. Um, and then we have uh, some immigrants or some refugees from Sudan. I don't think we've, Sudan and Iraq. Um, and then I believe Burma is our kind of second largest. Um, and then within that uh, Burmese community, we have Chin, Hakka Chin, and Karen are two of the, the three of the big ethnic groups that we serve. And to piggyback on what Javi said, the reason um, the State Department does that is because we're, they put U.S. ties, um, and so they place people here when they have U.S. ties. So they might have a pastor, they might have a cousin, they might have, um, you know, brother, sister. So if they have a U.S. tie, um, it helps better, you know, um, when they're coming over. And we have heard, though, that we might get some um, non-tie cases, um, meaning that we might be able to see um, Syrians, Iraqis, Afghanis, um, but for right now, it's Congolese and Burmese um, predominantly. Okay, well, I have another question then. Um, as part of getting ready for this, I did a little bit of reading and my um, understanding, um, I had put a graph up earlier that the numbers, Every year there's a number that is sent to um, uh, Congress, I believe, with it's the cap. It's the cap for how many refugees will be allowed into the country. And that um, has gone down significantly. Um, I, I wanna say that for a couple of decades, we were between 60,000, 80,000. Prior to that, it might've been 100,000. But then we dropped very significantly to the point that last year it was 18,000 and proposed for this year was 15,000. Um, I, I mean, I would think that that had to have had a significant impact, um, maybe particularly on world relief because you're used to probably having more people that you're assisting and to have it drop so suddenly. Um, and then knowing that it might change, there's been some talk that it may ramp back up. So how has that affected your office? Um, so I would say the majority of us in our office have never experienced um, the an arrival um, year of more than 100. Um, Rocco and Bexod have been there the longest. And so of the prior administration, the presidential determination was limited. So every year, um, President Trump would um, decrease it. Now with the new administration, um, President Biden, it's supposed to release something this afternoon as to whether they're gonna increase the presidential determination. Um, there's been rumors that it would go up to 125,000. Um, it might just stay steady and he will have um, people that are in line and pipeline overseas waiting to come over, have those expedited. And then in the new fiscal year, um, have the numbers increase, but yeah, I think this is why we had a lot more secondary migrants and because, you know, our numbers from overseas were just becoming so low. Um, so we are definitely excited. We are ramping up our efforts and making sure that we have all the necessities stocked in our warehouses. Um, we're hiring for more positions just with the assumption that we will be getting more arrivals. I was wondering, are you going to offer um, contact information for like tapestry farms and the Good Neighbors program at the end of the program maybe? Um, actually, it will come out. We, we send a follow-up email with a link to the recording um, and I'll include links to um, their websites. Um, I'll check with presenters to see about including personal contact info, but definitely will at least give you access to their website. Um, and that'll come out in a day or two once, um, once we fin wrap up here. So, thank you. 
Yep. I have a question. Yes. And, um, well, kind of a statement of the question, Bo. Um, I, I understand there's limited job opportunities for non-English speaking people in the communities. And so I'm going to suggest that if we're concerned about the packing plants that we in our churches advocate for good working conditions because of the lack of, of available jobs. I also know that there's things um, done um, in communities that help um, immigrants learn English, uh, or refugees, I'm sorry, learn English and um, perhaps move into other positions. And I know from Mazahar, my experience of Mazahar in Iowa City, that there's professional people that come as refugees that are unable to practice their um, major positions that they've had in the countries that they have been forced to leave. And so I'm wondering if anyone can speak to um, what you do to help um, people grow in the citizenship here in the United States. Yeah, I can take that one. So currently at World Relief, we have a RSS uh, employment program. Mm -hmm. So traditionally it helps them with that, that, that first kind of job, but then they also continue to work on employment skills. So if, whether that's going back to community college, um, I know specifically, you know, we have a person that did carpentry in his uh, country of origin. And so the RSS person worked with him to get connected with, um, oh, I can't remember, but a, a family owned business that um, worked with uh, like pipe fitting and things like that. So, so we do offer that more intensive employment program, but then, with some of our other jobs, it's just meeting that immediate need of, uh, of financial stability, kind of first self-sufficiency, and then we kind of continue to help. We also have a, a youth mentoring program okay. that traditionally works with younger refugees. And so they match these students with mentors that are helping them think about kind of the future and employment options. So that's one of the things I know we offer. Um, we did have a question come in asking, um, and I don't know if you all will know this or if anybody else on um, the webinar will know, but um, are there other groups like this active in other parts of the diocese? And do you know, Loxie, Glenn, anybody the, know? The, the, Mary, the Mary McCauley Center was resettling refugees in the um, in the northern half of the Iowa City Cedar Rapids corridor, though I don't think that they were, I don't think there were many that they were resettling in Iowa City. I think most of them were in Cedar Rapids or Waterloo. Uh, there's a large uh, resettlement uh, uh, program out of Des Moines, but I don't think that they've ever resettled many in the western part of the diocese, and it has most it to do with, again, um, if you are connected with a family already in place, you'll find Des Moines, Waterloo, Cedar Rapids, Iowa City, the Quad Cities, as opposed to the, the small rural communities kind of on the western edge. So it's, it's kind of the Mary McCauley Center was doing it. Uh, and, and for a long period of time, the, 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 the Dubuque Archdiocese's Catholic Charities was resettling in, in their archdiocese. But when about four years or so ago, they had to shutter the program that had been in place for 70 years because of the, the significant drop in numbers. And yeah, Kent, I know that um, the Mary McCauley, they're still active. Um, we, we have a group um, with our state refugee coordinator in Iowa, and there's about five other agencies um, that, you know, we do these quarterly calls and um, discuss, you know, basically where some of the barriers we're facing, how can we help each other out? But yeah, they are still active. I just don't know their numbers right now. Well, there's several in Iowa City. <clears throat> you know, the Catholic Worker Movement, the Compassion Movement uh, at the church there. And they, it's not exactly resettlement, but they do a lot of actual resettlement. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, and to that point, 
Right. So the type of work that World Relief is doing is that first three month period of time, although that's that's really kind of an understatement as to what World Relief is doing because they're staying involved with folks for periods of months or, or years thereafter, where where a Catholic worker is helping folks that have been resettled by an agency that first three month period of time and then because maybe they don't maintain those relationships or they move from Cedar Rapids to Iowa City, the, the worker house is a, a very hospitable community uh, support for uh, both immigrants as well as refugees. And, they and are also, they're also taking people from the Southern border, um, you know, getting them out of uh, some of the situations they're in and bringing them to Iowa City and living with them here. Right. Well, I think it's also the case that uh, in, in Iowa City, uh, there's a substantial Congolese population, and they have developed institutions of their own. I mean, it, it, uh, I, I would think would play a large role in the whole process of uh, settle, settling uh, incoming uh, Congolese. And then the other large, large community is, is uh, Sudanese. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of organizations within the Sudanese community to the same extent as Congolese. Um, yes, as Kim said in the beginning, after that three months period, you know, the, uh, the communities itself, they have an organization like, as, as you said, Kim, Sudanese community have Sudanese associations, Congolese community mm -hmm. have. We have immigrant and refugees or, organization here in Iowa City, where we really help, you know, those, all those associations try to help newcomer. Uh, but of course, the, the, the thing that uh, organization like resettlement organizations such as the World Relief and everyone is really putting, you know, that first step and the base for those to start. And after that, you know, they they will find another help from different other organizations. Um, we had a question about is anything, let's see, do, wondering about contributions um, to help out your organizations. Are you, do you receive any money back um, from perhaps maybe some of the employers in the area where a lot of the workers um, <laughs> out or? <laughs> I'm thinking of Tyson. I don't think I don't think that they think of themselves as doing anyone a favor. But <laughs> I don't write the questions, folks. I just read them. Oh, well, the question was mine, and the question was, does Tyson contribute any money to any of the organizations? Yes. Um, no. And I would let me just give you one minute from an alternative viewpoint, okay? Because the road to hell is paved with good intentions. If you have not visited a meatpacking plant, you need to do that immediately. You need to go to the kill floor. You need to go to the employee staff room where they are spending 30 minutes putting on protective gear. You need to go to the line where they need to push a button to ask a supervisor to go to the bathroom and that may be um, denied. You need to go to the nurse if they're on duty and ask about the health and safety. This is not a, uh, this is like, we, this is like being on the pipeline for sending people to work in a brothel. This is serious. Yeah. And um, I cannot emphasize enough that to think that Catholics of any variety are assisting this or assisting Tyson just Go on any go on any website for United Food and Commercial Workers and ask about Tyson. It's a multinational corporation which grinds employees to the ground. So I know I'm dealing with people with good hearts and with good intentions. It's not enough. You need to educate yourself about Tyson. Enough. Um, I completely agree, Clara, and I think um, it takes community members like yourselves and everybody else on this call to have, you know, some action um, and, you know, to make sure that our, sorry, to make sure that our, our families and refugees um, do have, you know, good job per, you know, perspectives and they're not getting hurt on the job like they do at Tyson. And, and part of that could be, um, 
you know, if there's, if there are individuals or parish organizations that want to take it on, it may also be not just, um, approaching Tyson about changing, but approaching other businesses about, can you, um, are there jobs? Can you provide other jobs for people who are trying to come in and make a life in our community? So uh, again, lots of different ways to look at it. Dan, if you're still on, I, I see your question. Is anything being done to plan for vaccinations? I'm thinking that's for resettlers, people who are being resettled. I, I can talk a little bit about that. I'm sure Laura and Javi might want to add to that. Um, so we do have um, connections with the um, Scott County Health Department and the Rock Island County Health Department. Um, actually, just this morning, um, I sent out a, a series of links of videos in a variety of languages that were created <coughs> um, by an organization in Vermont, um, Swahili, Somali, um, French, a variety of languages, um, working to, to um, just talk about the vaccine and kind of just the basics about the process and how it works. Um, there, there is some concern in, um, I'm, I'm more familiar with the Congolese community there is some concern in the Congolese community about um, getting the vaccine. And um, so we're just having some conversations. Ultimately, people get to choose whether or not um, they want to do that. And so we, we honor that. Hmm. Um, so there is, there is work being, being done. Thank you. And in Illinois, there, um, there public health department, we had a meeting yesterday and they're working on messaging like Ann was talking about how to um, dispel the fears and the myths. Um, and I know with Rock Island County Health Department, they hopefully will be hiring some of our refugees to be a trusted messenger and be able to talk about um, the, the vaccination. We did that with the, when COVID first came about, you know, what does this mean? It's when you hear it from somebody in your own language, in your own community, it, it's sometimes better than us saying, hey, you should get it done. Well, I think that's that's great. I, that is that I think it's a much a much more powerful message, like you said, when it comes from that trusted messenger and someone in your own language and from with with similar background to you, similar life perspective. Um, I want to be real respectful of everybody's time, and so I'm going to do my wrap up message. But um, we can leave this open for a while longer if people want. Um, presenters, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure that we only covered about this much. And one thing I would ask of you, um, since we hadn't gotten to it, is if there is a need from the community, if there's something that you need from the community, will you email that to me and I will make sure that that goes out. And I don't even necessarily mean tangible goods, although that's fine. If you need us advocating for different things, um, if you need more people um, to walk with refugees like Nikki and her friends have been doing. Um, if you'll let me know, I can get that information out to um, not only this group, but through our diocesan newsletter. Um, so thank you all for being part of this. As I said, I will leave it open if you have um, questions or comments. Um, but like I said, I always try to be very respectful and we say 12 to one. So um, we won't be offended if you pop out of Zoom. Any other questions or comments? I have one about uh, interpretation uh, for people that come in from another country. Um, how are they being um, helped with interpretation to from English or vice versa? Um, is there any organization that help with interpreting? Um, what are you trying to do? Their language? Um, and I'll can't did, you um, want, did you want to leave? Do is we have anything you, um, here? regarding like helping with interpretation through the University of Iowa hospitals through different languages that we can use? I, I, there's a couple of questions and I, I think that the Laura could probably, Laura and, and Javi could probably say it as well. But when you're talking about <clears throat> reunification and, or it, it's a resettlement based on like a family connection, okay. oftentimes the family that's been here for a period of time is actually able to assist in some of the translation efforts. 
Okay. So, but if you're at the University of Iowa Hospital, I mean, they've got folks that are on call at any moment in any language from any department. And it's, I've, I've actually accompanied, uh, I've accompanied refugees to the need for emergency medical care at the University of Iowa and they'll pull somebody from another apartment, another department because of their language skills. So in that respect, if you find somebody that's in need, and, and I'm assuming that, that Unity on, would, would aspire to have the same level of support, but uh, relatives that are already here and medical professionals within the community. Um, the Center for Worker Justice of Eastern Iowa in Iowa City is a place where folks are going, immigrants and refugees, their meetings, I've been to their meetings and they're in four languages. And so they've got leaders, emerging leaders that are providing that information in those, those ways as well. Uh, interpretive services, uh, it's kind of hit or miss. I mean, there are lines that you can call to cure somebody that is in need of, of interpretive services uh, if, if your staff or your people don't have the, the same language needs. Uh, our office does not provide interpretive services. We would have to rely on outside sources to do so. I just wondered. That's all. Yeah. Um, and Javi, I'm saying Javi deals with um, in, in translators and interpreters almost daily um, because we have to have it with some of our, our documents or medical things. So Javi, do you want to tell kind of about your experience? Yeah. So I mean, we're really lucky too. Not only do we have staff that speak multiple languages in our office that we, you know, pull for translation. I'm a, I, I'm not a native Spanish speaker, but I do, I learned Spanish. So I'm, you know, speaking to Spanish clients for other staff programs, but we also have staff, uh, previous refugees or community members that are willing to help people from their own community with something. So that's probably been our best bank of other refugee community leaders that help us with translation when it's needed. Okay. I have a question for you. Yeah. The, who chose uh, the resettlement town, the refugee or the refugee or so the resettlement organization? It's usually the resettlement organization. Um, but like Laura said, traditionally they do their best to, to match someone up with where they have a US tie, a family member that is already here. Oh, okay. Sure. And that's where you might see a lot of those secondary migrants where they're resettled here. But like we had a family, talking about the, is it Catherine McCauley Center in Cedar Rapids? We had a family, the daughter was resettled here, but she had friends that lived in Cedar Rapids. So after her three months, she moved to Cedar Rapids and was connected with the Catherine McCauley Center. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is um, <laughs> any opportunity you have to have conversations with folks as they're learning English, any any conversation is good and and whether they be in your neighborhood or they're attending your house of worship or uh, you you just it, and it, when we get back to regular times when we're out and and be able to interact better any any expression of of uh, willingness to have a conversation is so valuable because of the acquisition of skills and the other thing to remember is this might, English might be their fourth language. So, you know, I mean, it's, uh, You're muted, Ken. You're muted. Sorry. <laughs> I was just saying that uh, take every opportunity to um, have conversations with folks, uh, house of worship, uh, place of business, um, in order to help them uh, learn what could be their fourth language. And I also think it, it just, just makes our community more welcoming. And like Nikki was saying that, you know, five years ago, they were working with a family. Now they're working with one of our other families from a totally different part of the world. Um, but yeah, showing that we are welcoming, that we are happy that we have different cultures here. Um, so it's really important. Yeah, just to reiterate the littlest things in the language with both sets of families, they both happen to have young kids. So we will just bring over a board game and it's amazing how quickly someone who doesn't speak a word of English, except hi, can pick up sorry and tease and like the competitive spirit. It's all just pretty universal. Some of it can be not uncomfortable, 
and the translators, you know, um, at World Relief, they sent us a list of three translators that we can call at any time if we really need to, you know, have that full concrete. But the um, Google Translate app actually works in a pinch when you just type in a short sentence. It'll it's a free app and it'll translate for you. So that's another option to make it accessible. It's hard, you know. I mean, if you're going to get into this, but it's make it lighthearted sometimes and. And then there's those resources that are available that are enormously helpful. I would say too that there's um, that there's real joy in learning another person's language. So I can say I now know enough Swahili to be dangerous. Um, I can understand kind of the basics of a conversation. I would never want to um, interpret for someone in an official capacity at all, but I can understand when someone needs a doctor, someone is having problems with their house, when they need food, um, if they want to go to church, I can understand these things. Um, uh, the other thing is, is um, I, I don't, I don't know where you are, Father Dennis, but in the Quad Cities, we do have a, co a company that um, provides interpreters and we do utilize them, um, especially for, um, we'll call on them for immigration appointments, medical appointments, um, but a lot of times those medical providers are required to provide interpreters. Um, and the other thing I would say too is in-person is always, almost always better. Um, it's the next step down is video interpreting. And then the last step is by, by phone only. Um, so um, in-person is almost always best. And it's always really important to make sure that the dialect matches up. So you can have someone who speaks Swahili, but they're from Tanzania. So they're going to have a different Swahili than someone who is from Congo or um, Pashto, for example, has different dialects. And so it, if you're with someone and, you, and they have an interpreter that is identified as being their language, but you, you see that they're confused, it immediately ask, is this, is this the right Swahili or is this the right Pashto? And I know at Unity Point Health, um, they actually have. You want to snuggle um, with Daddy for a little bit? They have interpreters like on call that you can call through the computer as well. I also want to just tell you that, Habi, and everyone who work with immigrants and refugees, uh, you know, I with my emails there. Uh, so share it with Amy and Habi if you can share it with the group. Uh, if you have anything in Eastern, I hear in Eastern, I like uh, in uh, Johnson County, I mean. Uh, you need help, interpretations, you need something here in the area, let me know, I can connect you with the right people. Or if you need like interpretation in Arabic, I can do that. And, and, and because I'm Sudanese, also if you have a Sudanese person, you want me to talk to them and just, uh, you know, make them feel good. Because I know when I came near this country, I was crying and I wanna go back. And I was like, no, no, I cannot survive here. This is not me, uh, you know, a lot of barriers. Yes, please feel free. I can connect you with a lot of people because at CWJ we have members, leaders from different communities. So uh, just reach out to me. I have my email on the chat. Please don't hesitate to do that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. <laughs> I will probably follow up on that. So sure. thank you. Just very quickly, uh, I just want to jump in and speak to the parish involvement. Um, I've been fortunate, thanks to Nikki's leadership, to be on the team now that actually I was supposed to at 1.30 be in Moline to uh, work on English with uh, Pawa, but uh, we canceled that till Monday because I don't think I'm going to drive across the bridge today. But um, I think the other side of this that we, we need to remember, as Pope Francis continually calls us to move to the margins, is facilitating that very real encounter with Christ through other people for our parishioners. And uh, taking people that like me that may not have ever had the courage to jump out on this uh, limb, but through Nikki's experience to say, hey, this is really great to bring me along and to go and meet these people and to just accompany them, just help them 
walk through this crazy time in their lives um, will change lives of parishioners too. So don't just stop at, we want to help these people. Let it multiply through your parishes. Let these get other people involved. The World Relief, I can't say enough about how they take our hands and, and lead us through and give every resource needed to make it as comfortable as possible. So I would really encourage folks to look at this through the lens of a, a parish activity that isn't just writing a check or uh, you know dropping some food off in the at the rectory to give to the food bank. That's great. We need money and food, but facilitating real personal encounters uh, with the people that really need it in our own backyard is uh, something that it's authentic Christianity, and it's something I just don't feel like we do enough of in our parishes on a daily basis. Hey Ryan, I think you said that beautifully, um, and. You know, that's one of our things at World Relief. We want to empower the church and volunteers to be able to have this mutual transformation, to be able to have lifelong friendships and, you know, like, and learning Zwahili and, you know, her clients learning English. So, um, yeah, I think you did that very, very well. Thank you. I just want to echo that praise, Ryan. I, um, this morning, I was at the home of um, one of my clients and the little four-year-old greeted me by saying, he pointed his finger at me and he says, my mom has lipstick. And I, I have no idea where that came from, but he felt like he needed to communicate that to whoever would listen to him. And that those moments happen all of the time. And dear Yashua wanted to tell the world that his mom had lipstick. So um, uh, it's uh, the struggle is real. It's hard, but the joy, man, can't beat it. I just have a quick question um, for donations. Do you guys um, take like items, like let's say for now the winter has come like winter clothing and items like that, or like um, for their house, do you guys take those sort of donations? We do. So um, every Wednesday we are, since we all are still working remotely, um, every Wednesday we do have a staff member in our office that is um, available to take any donations that can be dropped off. Um, winter clothing for sure, definitely coats, gloves, and hats, um, and then household items always. Uh, so you know, tablecloth, uh, utensils, things like that. Yeah. And the only thing that we can't take, but I believe our secondary migrants, maybe Anne, is mattresses. Um, just with the the money we get from the federal government, we can't. We have to buy new mattresses. So. Um, I do know people have, you know, donations of like a brand new mattress and then we'll call Ann or call one of our secondary migrants and say, who needs a new mattress? So. I just did that this morning. That's so funny. <laughs> you said that. I said, yeah. So for Tapestry Farms, um, we, uh, we take donations um, when we need them. So we don't have storage space. We, um, I'm sitting in my house right now. We actually do have an office now, which is exciting. Um, but um, we don't have the capacity to take donations on a regular basis. But if you have, I'm gonna make something up, a size extra large um, sweatshirt for a man and you think it might make a good fit, um, you can message me and I'm going to tell you yes or no. And then if I say no, I'm probably going to send you to World Relief. <laughs> I just want to give you an idea for everybody work with refugees. Uh, you know, here, the refugee and immigrant tend not to do the first step when, when uh, try to like uh, make a connection with an Iowan. So they were scared that maybe they don't like them. They just heard all this about discrimination and everything. Maybe they don't like them because they're African or because of they are black or anything. But they are very welcome people if you done that first step. So if you would like to connect here in Iowa, we have a program in our the Center for Worker Justice. Every uh, year during the gala that we held, I will tell the people that if you would like to connect with a family, reach out to me. Uh, a lot of family need somebody, 
maybe the mom and the dad, they go to the community colleague, they need somebody to navigate the homework with them, or they need them to navigate the homework with their children. They need just to know how to drive or how to read the driver test. Many, many things that you, if you talented and we can connect you, and, and they will make, you know, they are looking for a family because coming here and you don't have your mom, you don't have your dad, you don't have your sister, you don't have a family that you can call when you are in crisis. Uh, we believe in neighbors. That's why sometimes I try to make a connection with the neighbor because uh, we think a neighbor is a close, is supposed to be a close friend. You, you are not in a good situation, you call them. So just if you have, share with your network, say, do you wanna be connected with, uh, you know, an immigrant family? Uh, I can give you a story. I, co I connected some people from the care to some uh, Sudanese family. And this woman, she become very friend with this family. And even they struggle in the beginning speaking. And now Rabab, the immigrants, she started speaking English because she tried to talk that to that woman. And she did herself, you know, like she tried her like very hard. And now she really talking English with her. And this woman, she gets sick and her, her children is outside. Robab, she went and stay in her house, cleaning her house, cooking for this woman, doing everything because we value that relationship. This is, will be like a family and it will be like benefit both the refugees and, you know, the, and the I want too. I guess do that kind of programs with your allies and supporters to connect with your, uh, you know, new refugees resettled in this country, yeah. Hey. Thank you everyone so much. Um, I can't say enough for the people who have shared their stories, um, uh, Javi and Anne and Mazhir and, um, I know uh, Laura had to hop off, so I totally understand that. Um, thank you everyone who was listening and asked questions. Um, we have a lot of information to get out to you and we will do that, give us a day or two and it, you should come out to the same email that you used when you signed up. Hopefully we'll see you again at another Lunch and Learn on our first Thursday of the month. Next month, we will be dealing with Care for Creation. So hopefully see you then. Thanks so much. Thank you.